Hi everyone, welcome back to The Physical Educator. Today we're going to talk about study design. We're going to start as we usually do with the assessment objectives to see what it is you're being asked to do here. It's a really short yet vital unit, not only important for your exams, but definitely important for your internal assessment. Here you're going to look at some key terms and understanding the difference between them terms whether it's specificity, accuracy, reliability and validity, or whether it's the different types of tests that are available for human performance, it's really important that we are able to distinguish and differentiate between all of these terms. So first we need to outline the importance of specificity, validity, accuracy and reliability in fitness testing. So firstly, we have specificity. Now this is talking about making the test specific to your performer. So the very obvious examples here are if you're testing a swimmer, they're in the pool. No matter what the test is, they're in the pool. If you're testing a football player, it makes sense to do the test. If you can on a football pitch, if you're testing a basketball player, it makes sense to do it on the basketball court. But you can be more specific than that too. Let's say the test is for power. You wouldn't do a 30 meter sprint test, you would do sergeant jump or broad jump or an equivalent test to test the power of the in the legs of the athlete. And that's what we're talking about here with specificity. Next we've got accuracy, making the test accurate. Now this is about the equipment that is used. An example for this, let's say it's sports day. I know this isn't fitness testing, but it's just an example of accuracy. Let's say it's sports day and you've got on the finish line for the sprint, five different people with a stopwatch each, and they're going to start the time and finish the time for somebody in each of the five lanes, let's say. That would bring a lot of accuracy issues. Did they start the watch at the right time? Did they end the watch at the right time? and there'd be huge, huge errors with the accuracy of, of that recording. And this is the same for testing, particularly with your IAs. I've, I've done a number of IAs previously with students where they've taken body weight of what well, body mass of a former. Now, if the scales are wrong or slightly dodgy, then it's gonna give inaccurate results that can affect the whole internal assessment. So it's important that no matter what it is, you can use it as accurate information and as accurate equipment as possible. The beauty of the world that we live in at the minute, there is a range of technologies that can be used. You can use sprint gates, you can use apps. I even did an IA with a student a few years ago where they were looking at kicking power, hamstring flexibility and kicking power in football. And we downloaded an app, speed of shot, when the football was being kicked. So accuracy is about the equipment and the accuracy of that equipment. Specificity, making it specific to the performer and the performer's needs. Accuracy, making the equipment that you use accurate. Next, we have reliability. This is ensuring that the protocol is adhered to. And what this means is, if this test was to be done again, the difference in results wouldn't be because you've set the test up differently. It would be because of something's happened to a variable or to a performer and therefore change has happened, which is good. That's why you retest to either prove consistency and you want similar results, or you might retest after a training program. You might retest at different times of the day, hoping to get different results. But the only way that becomes purposeful is if the test is completed reliably and you make sure that you follow the protocol every single time completely as it should be. You know, very obvious reliability issues such as not taking your trainers off for the sit and reach test, bending your knees slightly when you do the sit and reach test. You could do this for any test, reliability. Make sure you complete the test adhering to the protocol in its entirety. And that's reliability. And lastly, we've got validity, ensuring that the test is suitable for the desired fitness outcome. So it's similar to specificity in some regards. So you've got to ensure you know the difference here. Specificity is making sure it's specific to the performer, specific to their position, specific to the components of fitness that they want to look at. And that's where validity sort of overlaps with specificity because it's ensuring that the test is suitable for the desired fitness outcome. So if a performer wanted to measure power, 
there's no point doing the sit and reach test. If they wanted to measure strength, you wouldn't be doing a sergeant job for measuring the power. You've got to make sure that the test is suitable. Otherwise, it's an invalid test. That's really important to note between specificity and validity and the, and the comparison between the two. But there's going to be a distinct difference for what you need to know on your exam. So ensure that you do know the difference between specificity and validity. Is it specific or is it valid? Take the long element of the word out of it. Focus on the word that you've heard before. Specific, accurate, reliable and valid. And what that word means. And that should help you to differentiate between these four terms. Remember, this is a science course. So even though that most of the experiments and the investigations that we do are practically based from a sports perspective, remember it is science. And if you were to get some of these things wrong in science, it could end very badly. Next, we're going to talk about study design and the importance within the world of sports science. Again, two birds, one stone, IAs and paper two exam. Let's start with research question. Do you have a specific problem in mind? Can you narrow that problem? Can you narrow it again? Then you've probably come up with a research question that's suitable to explore. Once you've done that, you need to think about your variables and you need independent variables. They're the changing ones. They're independent to the study. And you also have dependent variables, and that's what your study's depending on. And this is what you're measuring more than likely stay the same. A hypothesis, a prediction as to what is going to happen within your study. And a null hypothesis is the opposite of your hypothesis. So if it doesn't happen, you prove your null hypothesis. We've then got to review literature that exists. And this is regarding the variables, the data, the statistics, other studies, etc. Once we've done that, we can look at testing. With testing, it needs to be specific, accurate, reliable and valid. And is retesting applicable? We then need to look at how we're going to collect the data. What data collection method will work best? We then have controls and how we can control this study. Can we use it with a placebo, a blind, a double blind, randomization of groups? So here, for example, using a blind study, subjects are not aware of what they are being tested for. A double blind, which is fantastic if you can do it. The subjects and you as the researcher are unaware of what is trying to be tested. And this means that the test is more than likely going to be a more valid, reliable test because there is no way, shape or form that the results can be doctored or played with, even if you didn't mean to. You know, sometimes you can subconsciously lean towards, oh, I'll just round that one up. And you can just have that approach because you want to prove something. You want to justify your hypothesis. Whereas with a double blind study, none of these things can happen. It's completely, I find out afterwards what the results are. All I do is number crunch accurately and fairly to start off with. It's really good double, uh, investigation double blind if you can do it. We also have the limitations to the study. So things that it's important to know and recognize about your study, the strengths and weaknesses, the limits of what are available. And also we have a conclusion where you summarize the relevant literature with your own outcomes and results. Couple more things, we have ethics to consider. So make sure no alcohol, no blood take, take in, but other ethical considerations might be relevant for your study. And lastly, adherence to health and safety, taking a park queue, which we'll talk about shortly, appropriate warm ups, assistance with machinery, etc. And let's not forget getting informed consent from your performers. Six point two point three wants us to look at the Park U and outline the importance of the physical activity readiness questionnaire. The Park U, the physical activity readiness questionnaire, something that's important to fill out before you start a training program. You will probably have done this yourself when you've been to a gym, maybe even at school with the school gym. So a pre-exercise screening is a key principle before sedentary individuals start to become physically active. It's also important to consider when you take the next step. So if you're going from, let's say, a beginner level to a more advanced level, 
it's important to maybe back, go back and review a park you with similar questions just to make sure that you're ready to make that step. Determining one's readiness for physical activity is a prudent and important first step in the fitness assessment and exercise prescription process. The PARQ is recommended to prior to low moderate exercise. It can be self-administered as it's just a questionnaire. You can do it at home, you can do it in the gym, but as long as you bring it before you're ready to start your exercise, you are all good. Other things to consider with the PARQ is composed of seven questions. So it's not extensive, but it's very concise. These questions are specific about the detection of pre-existing medical conditions and injuries. If an answer is yes to one or more of these questions, it is essential to consult with a doctor before the training program can commence. And that's the role of the personal trainer or the member of staff in a gym or the teacher in the school to intervene with this park and say, okay, you have selected yes for this answer. Therefore, we need to discuss this before you can start exercising so nothing happens. If the answer is no to all the questions, great, you should be good to go, which most of us hopefully should be. And the reason why the PARQ is completed is because of there is a possibility of undetected serious disease. And this is completely diminished by PARQ. The PARQ not only helps you determine your readiness to begin exercise, it also determines your readiness to intensify a physical activity exercise program, something that I spoke about earlier. It is designed and was designed to prevent sudden death syndrome. However, more commonly, it is designed to prevent injury or to prevent further injury. Because it might be that you say, if you've got a heart condition, then you're going back to your doctor and they're gonna review whether exercise is suitable for you and what exercise is suitable for you. Similarly, if you've had a previous injury, let's say a shoulder injury, then that information can be disclosed to a gym. And if you're looking for a personal trainer, they will look at that and they'll also have a discussion with you. And then you will choose suitable exercises not to provoke that injury. Some examples that you usually see on there, things to do with medical history, injury history, exercise trends. If you already have some, you might not, therefore you're a sedentary individual. Your lifestyle, your drinking, your smoking, etc., your food and your fitness goals, things that you want to achieve. They're things that you tend to find on the park queue. And if all is good, you are good to go. And lastly, we need to evaluate field, laboratory, submaximal and maximal tests of human performance. Four types of testing. Field testing, a test that is conducted in the natural habitat of the sport, is not requiring specific equipment to conduct the test. So easy examples here are tennis player looking at the power or accuracy of the shots. They're obviously going to do that on the court. Even if they were looking at their speed over 10 meters, they would possibly do that on the court. If they're going to look at their agility, they might do it on the baseline. They might do it from the baseline to the net, etc. So they're going to use the court as much as they can. This is great because it's very useful. It's very accessible and it's very relevant to the performer. Next, we have lab testing. This is usually conducted in a controlled environment using specialist equipment. This is a picture of me at a sports lab in Dubai called Nano M, fantastic facility if you ever get the chance to go. And we did the VO2 max for a student's IA. And this is great because VO2 max is relevant to all performers, as you'll know from learning VO2 max through, through the IV sports science. And every sport that requires cardiovascular endurance needs to measure VO2 max and needs to develop and further VO2 max. So this lab test, this specific test is brilliant for all sports. The major problem, it's not accessible, it's expensive. And if you're not an elite sports player, you might not have the access to this lab test. So therefore you can't get the information as often as you would like it. Next we have sub-maximal tests, and this is as it sounds. It's a test that does not require you to reach your maximum effort levels. Instead, it predicts effort levels based on sub-maximal efforts. Big problem with this, it depends how hard you work, it depends how much effort you put in, things like the bleep test, things like the 12 minute Cooper test. It depends on the effort you put in. So it's not as accurate as doing a VO2 max test, yet it's much more accessible and it can at least give you some information which is better than none. 
And lastly, we have maximal testing. Again, as it sounds, a test that requires the performer to realize short-term exhaustion whilst attempting to reach maximum effort levels. One rep max, wing gate test, VO2 max test. These are all maximal tests. So, some more information for you. Field tests, there's many field tests. I've just gone for a few. Illinois agility test, swimming bleep test, running bleep test. The pros of a field test, it's easy to set up, usually cheap and effective and specific to the sport. Cons, can lack accuracy, can require a level of motivation that might not be there, usually completed in groups, so other factors may disrupt accuracy of results, peer pressure, anxiety, self-esteem. Lab tests, VO2 max, wing gate, force plate test, where you see how high you can jump, and the force that's plated through your gait. The pros of lab tests, unbelievably accurate to the components of fitness that you're measuring. Results can be precise and they can inform a training design. Individually completed, eliminating any external factors, usually completed in a lab, so weather isn't a, isn't a factor that affects the results neither. Usually very expensive, both by either booking the equipment or if you're gonna buy your own equipment, it's still not cheap. There's a chance of injury because most of these tests are gonna require you to push yourself to your limits. And they're not sport specific. Albeit you can argue that the results can be linked to the sport, it doesn't give you sport specific feedback. Submaximal tests, Harvard step test, a strand test, the Bruce treadmill test. There's many submax tests that you can look at yourself. They're just, again, a few. It's less stressful, less chance of injury, can repeat in a short time frame, good correlation with maximal tests. It can also be performed on mass, many people at once, such as when you do the bleep test or the Harvard step test in lesson. The cons, it's an estimate of maximal fitness. It's hard to set the intensity accurately because it's up to the performer to set the intensity as they're performing. Hence, there's a level of motivation required. And lastly, maximal tests, 30 meter sprint test, VO2 max test, wing gate test are some examples. It's a very accurate measure of fitness, very accurate results, allow specific training targets to be set. Strict protocol and administration makes retest comparisons extremely reliable and accurate. The cons, there's a chance of injury. You can't repeat them within a short time frame because you've realized exhaustion. Might not complete the test, yielding no result for the performer. Let's say you're doing the VO2 max test, but you, you drop out before you get to your maximum and you can have a much lower score than your actual VO2 max test. So there is a level of motivation that's required for this to really dig deep and push yourself to the max. Our point on unit six, including statistical analysis with standard deviation, t-tests and correlation, including QR codes and suggested reading, as well as study design, different types of tests, components of fitness and principles of training. Visit the TES website and check out the Physical Educator channel there. Thanks for watching. See you again soon.